so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode contains graphic depictions of violent crimes. Listener discretion is advised. It's a bleak, cold morning on July 4, 1975. A 34-year-old man named Eddie Trigg waits inside the Carousel Cabaret nightclub, known to most as a seedy bar located in the heart of Sydney's King's Cross. But that's not why Eddie, with a beard and sharp hazel eyes, is there. After all, it's just past 10.30am. He's there to meet someone. Juanita Nielsen, the 37-year-old owner and publisher of the newspaper Now, makes her way towards the establishment. These will be the final moments of her life. It's 10.40am when she arrives. She's greeted at reception and escorted up the stairs to the VIP lounge. She is there for what she believes to be a work meeting. She's never seen again. Whispers have circulated around Sydney since. Some say her body is buried under an airport runway. Others are convinced her body is hidden beneath sand dunes. But 46 years on, Juanita Nielsen is still known as the woman who vanished, and her body has never been found. We do know, however, that she was a woman who had enemies. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with journalist and author Peter Rees about the unsolved disappearance of Juanita Nielsen, which, despite two police investigations, a coronial inquest and a federal parliament inquiry, remains one of Australia's great unsolved murder mysteries. On July 4, 1975, Juanita Nielsen went to the Carousel Club in King's Cross. What was she doing there that morning and who was she meeting? Well, she left her home at 202 Victoria Street at about 10.30 a.m. on that overcast Friday in the middle of winter in Sydney and walked up, so far as I've been able to determine, a back lane to uh, the Carousel Cabaret. Now, the Carousel was a club that staged drag reviews and they wanted to advertise in Juanita's paper that she owned and edited and that's why she went there that Friday morning arriving at the club at about 10.40am to be met by the receptionist, Loretta Crawford. What do we know about how that morning unfolded and the last time she was seen? When she arrived, Loretta Crawford, who had an inkling that things were not all that they seemed, was really, really worried about what might unfold. She just picked up signs, murmurings over the past few weeks about Juanita's name being mentioned and how she was being viewed negatively by principals at the club. And she had this sudden feeling that it would have been better for Juanita not to have arrived. But she greeted her and had small talk with her. And while she did that, the club's night manager, Eddie Trigg, walked down the stairs to greet Juanita on the landing. Who was Juanita Nielsen? What type of person was she and what did she do for a living? Juanita was a member of the extended Mark Foy's family. She was 38 years old. She'd been schooled at the exclusive Ravenswood School in Sydney on the North Shore. She'd left school at the age of 15. She'd actually done some modelling where her head was placed onto the bodies of more buxom women on the lowbrow Carter Brown novelettes of the time. The family was not too impressed when they saw this and the modelling career did not proceed very much after that. She was a strong-minded, 
free spirit. She was adventurous and this led her to, at the age of 21, board a ship. There were no airlines in those days really for travel overseas and she travelled to Europe. And it was while there, cruising around Europe on a cargo ship, that she met a Danish seaman by the name of Nielsen. And they married after a while. And she lived in Europe during the early 60s before the marriage failed and she came back to Australia and took a job at Mark Foy's Emporium in the city. And what did Juanita's career path look like from there? She'd returned via Carnaby Street and had a real sense of the emerging fashions that were taking over the Western world at that time. And she brought them to Australia and set up a boutique store within the Mark Foy's building. And she called that store the Gearbox. And it was very with it, to use the terminology of the day. She was friendly with DJs. She staged shows. She got publicity. And she was building a profile and then suddenly she was blindsided by the family's decision to sell Mark Foy's to a rival retailer, McDowell's, and she had one share in the company and she used that share to oppose the sale. But the reason she was opposing it was that she feared for the careers of all the many workers who had been at Mark Foy's for years and for whom Mark Foy's was their way of life. In fact, they knew no other job. She stood up against the sale of the firm but lost. Ultimately, her father, whom she'd been trying to encourage to oppose the sale, he buckled and agreed to sell his shareholding. And when her father, Neil Smith, sold that, she was at a loose end. She by this stage was living at the cross and became friendly with Ted Knopfs, the late Reverend Ted Knopfs, who'd set up the Wayside Chapel. And she started writing a column there for that paper that he was setting up. And it coincided with a period where her father attempted to heal the breach with her and made an offering of $50,000 to her, which she accepted, to buy her house, 202 Victoria Street. And with her location, her home settled, she decided to buy out Ted Knopf's and take over the running of the paper. It was a local paper. It ran advertorial type stories. And it was just a series of stories about events and shops and sales and interesting people within the King's Cross Potts Point general area. So that's how she was seeing her life as the 1970s came around. And so when she met that person at the Carousel Club to discuss selling advertising in her paper, which I believe was called Now, what kind of mind frame was she in when she arrived? Like, was she scared? Was she hesitant? Because it had been a difficult few weeks in the lead up. It certainly had been a difficult few weeks because, as I said, now when Juanita took it over, it was very much a local paper that ran colour stories, advertorials and so forth. But then with the change in planning laws that allowed the concentration of buildings on Victoria Street and Woolloomooloo, she, by 1974, had become an activist opposed to the wholesale demolition of the old houses that lined the streets, in particular her own street, Victoria Street, with its magnificent arcade of plane trees. And the developers who had moved into the street were keen to rid the street, the houses, of the bohemian tenants who'd been living there for decades. And Juanita could see the community being destroyed and she started writing about this in her paper encouraging green bands. And so by July 1975, she was a thorn in the side of the developers, and in particular one developer by the name of Frank Tooman, who owned most of the houses that were going to be demolished and redeveloped in Victoria Street. So when she arrived at the carousel that day, she was very much the last line of antagonism to the developers in the way that she was able to encourage green bands and she was actually in the process of renewing green bands. 
The developers, in particular Frank Tiemann, had tried to mediate with her, but she didn't want a bar of their plans, and so she rejected all their overtures. Frank Tiemann had been held up by this stage in his development plans and was losing a million dollars a year in interest repayments with no progress whatsoever. He sent a message to the street by having Arthur King abducted from his flat in April 1973. There was a clear message that he was not someone to be trifled with. He was friends with the principals at the carousel and in particular with the manager of the carousel, Jim Anderson, who actually oversaw the abduction of Arthur King in April 1973. So when Juanita arrived there that morning, there was a lot of tension. There was a lot of animus towards her. She was standing in the way. Frank Tiemann was at his wit's end and the only way forward was to stop the Green Bands and to stop the people behind the organisation of the Green Bands and in particular Juanita Nielsen. Now, in the previous week, there'd been some strange things happening. There'd been an attempt to encourage Juanita to attend a meeting at the Camperdown Travel Lodge near Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. She thought that strange and decided that she'd pass it up. After all, the overture that she received about that meeting was that it was for landscaping, but she thought that strange. Then on the Monday, before all these events came to a head, Eddie Trigg and his friend, Shane Martin Simmons arrived around at 202 Victoria Street ostensibly to negotiate advertising for the Carousel Cabaret with Juanita, but she was not ready. And David Farrell, her partner and business partner, answered the door and talked to Eddie Trigg about what he wanted. And so it was arranged that Eddie Trigg would phone Juanita later that week with the intention of organising a meeting to discuss advertising. And that's why Juanita was at that club, the Carousel Cabaret, on the morning of July 4. Why did these green bands matter so much to Juanita? Because she had money, she was relatively secure. Why do you think that this was a cause that she fought so hard for to protect these properties on Victoria Street? She became intimately involved with the community. It was not so much that she was focused on the buildings. I mean, of course, they were part and parcel of this. But what she could see happening was the destruction of the community. She was part of this community in Victoria Street, in Woolloomooloo, the streets around the cross, and she did not want to see people who'd lived all their lives there forced out of their homes with the violence that was being enforced on the streets. I mean, you've got to remember that this was a time when it was not uncommon for thugs to turn up at houses, banging on doors with baseball bats, crowbars, what have you, threatening intimidation. It was a very scary scene that she was posing and she believed that she, through her paper, could give voice to the genuine claims of the residents to keep their community intact. There was the abduction plot prior to her disappearance. Men were actually charged over that, weren't they? That's correct. What eventuated was that after Juanita disappeared, police interviewed Shane Martin Simmons, who worked in the club scene. He was a wannabe thug, basically. And he mentioned that there'd been this plan to abduct Juanita on that Monday before when he and Eddie Trigg had gone round to her house and if she'd been there alone, their plan was to encourage her into Eddie Trigg's car and if she opposed, they were going to put a pillow slip over her head and carry her against her will, if necessary, into the car parked outside in Victoria Street and the intention was to abduct her and take her to some people for a discussion. But these people were never named. Who do you think those people sort of higher up were? Because the name Abe Saffron has come up. Did it go that high? Abe Saffron owned the club where all this happened, but the principal involved in all of this 
was Jim Anderson. He was the one who had overseen the abduction of Arthur King two years earlier. He was the one who was close friends with Frank Tiemann and in particular with Frank Tiemann's drug addict son, Tim Tiemann, who he'd given a job to after he got back from Israel where he'd fled after being charged with drugs earlier in Australia. And it was Jim Anderson who was organising all of these events. He was the one who ordered Eddie Trigg and Shane Martin Simmons to go to Winita's house on that Monday before with the intention of abducting her. And it was Jim Anderson who ordered Trigg to ring Winita to finalise the arrangements for the meeting on that Friday at the carousel and to which Winita went to complete the deal, as I say. Abe Saffron was the owner of the club, but he was not involved in Juanita's murder. What happened was that his name was used by Jim Anderson to justify what was going on because of his legendary influence with police and politicians in that period. Eddie Trigg, who was he? Is he sort of a cog in the machine? You say he was sort of ordered to, you know, call Juanita into the club that day. Was he a cog in a machine or or do you see him as more of a major player in a story like this? Eddie Trigg was a psychopath. I spoke to his ex-wife some years ago and she described to me how she'd been kicked in the stomach when she was pregnant, how he'd held a gun to her head. He was a very violent man and he had a love of guns and he was the ideal person to be running this. He had had a criminal history going back to his childhood and he'd spent time in jail. And so he was an ideal person to be Jim Anderson's right-hand man. And it was in that capacity that he was ordered to undertake the meeting to set it up with Juanita. And did he end up going to jail for the failed kidnapping attempt? Because he was imprisoned for a period, wasn't he? That's correct. He was charged with conspiracy to abduct along with Shane Martin Simmons and he fled overseas where he was arrested in San Francisco, brought back to Australia and pleaded guilty to the charge of conspiring to abduct Juanita. Shane Martin Simmons was also found guilty of conspiring to abduct and they both served jail time for that crime, a crime which stopped a short way from the actual disappearance and murder of Juanita, and indeed it was to be the crime that we would, well, even from today's perspective, only see as the end result of the investigation into what happened to Juanita. The charge of murder was never laid against anybody. You uncovered in your book that there was a check exchanged between Frank Tiemann, who you referred to earlier, and Jim Anderson, the manager of the Carousel cabaret nightclub. Why do you think that cheque that was exchanged six weeks before Juanita's murder is significant? It was a cheque that was paid by Frank Tiemann to Jim Anderson, a company cheque in the name of his development company, and it was paid within a matter of days after Juanita had published a major article about the devastation and destruction of events in Victoria Street and announcing the campaign that she was waging for new green bands. And this was the final straw, I believe, for Frank Tiemann. He paid Jim Anderson this company cheque of $25,000 and then he had second thoughts. He realised that there would be a trail, a money trail here. And in panic, he went round to Abe Saffron's house in Vaucluse and knocked on the door and said, look, I've just given Jim Anderson a check for $25,000, I need to get it back. Would you have $25,000 cash that I could borrow from you? To which Abe Saffron laughed at him and said he didn't carry that sort of money on the premises. This meant that the money trail was established because the check went through and the check was paid for a fraudulent deal that allegedly involved Jim Anderson acquiring a club at Bondi on behalf 
of Frank Tiemann's way with son, Tim Team, in order to set him up in business and try and set him on the straight and narrow and away from drugs. And was this the kind of stuff that in the mid-1970s was happening in terms of if someone got in your way, you got rid of them? Like, was that kind of customary when it came to men in Sydney with this sort of power? Absolutely. You've got to remember that Jim Anderson was a killer. He had shot a standover man by the name of Donny the Glove Smith down at the Venus Room, one of the greatest sleaze bars and a brothel in Orwell Street, King's Cross. It shot him in the back and he was charged with murder and he got off. He was no billed by the Attorney General of the day. This was the power that the criminals of King's Cross wielded. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with journalist and author Peter Rees about the unsolved disappearance of Juanita Nielsen. What went wrong with the police investigation? Because as you say, that's pretty straightforward when you've got a cheque exchanged and you can point to it. Why is it that this case wasn't solved at the time? This was a crime that should have been solved within a matter of days. And the reason it wasn't was that the police investigation very quickly was directed away from the carousel. The crime scene was evident. This was a club where Juanita had gone into a a location and disappeared in the middle of the day. The senior police have admitted to me in the years since that it should have been declared a crime scene immediately. But instead, the police focused on the fact that she was an heiress who'd gone missing, that she had a history of going missing before, which was preposterous, that she'd been seen getting into a yellow car in Darlinghurst Road, not far from the carousel on that same morning. As it turned out, I discovered that the person who came forward with that story was a friend of Jim Anderson's. And so the police went off on these various other leads rather than focusing on the carousel and the fact that Juanita was a thorn in the side of the developers. They were looking everywhere but the real reason and the real location I believe this was because of the corruption that existed in King's Cross at the time, especially among the licensing police. Now, what I discovered in the years of my investigation was that the police investigation was overseen by a corrupt superintendent by the name of Jack McNeil, who answered to the police commissioner of the day, Fred Hansen, who was corrupt. Both of these men had been adversely commented on in the Moffat Royal Commission into organised crime in clubs in 1974. So Jack McNeil was seen as the bagman for the police commissioner. The investigating police were under no illusions that focusing on club land and the carousel as a result was something that was not going to be very productive in terms of the investigation and their careers. So this is why they spent so much time looking in other directions. Has Loretta Crawford, who's that woman at the beginning who greeted Juanita when she arrived that day at the Carousel Club, has Loretta Crawford ever spoken about what she saw or what she thinks happened to Juanita? I tracked down Loretta Crawford in the 1990s. I always figured that she might have more to tell. What happened after the 1983 inquest into Anita's disappearance was nothing. The police did nothing. And so I worked with Arthur King, who'd been kidnapped, as I mentioned, in April 1973. Arthur King and I spent our spare time following up, tracking down people, and we tracked down Loretta Crawford, and talked to her on many occasions. And finally, in July 2000, Loretta told us what she had seen, what she said she had seen after Juanita arrived at the club on that Friday morning, July 4. And what she said was that Loretta had come back down the stairs with Eddie Treep 
and Eddie Trigg had continued down the stairs with Juanita and there was a cellar with a door off the stairs and she said that she had heard a commotion and she'd some minutes later gone down the stairs and into the cellar where she claimed she saw Juanita lying dead with a bullet in her head. So that's what she told us in July 2000, a story she'd kept to herself until that period. And I revealed that story when I first published my book on the murder of Juanita Nielsen in 2004. But there was another story as well because along with Loretta, there'd been somebody else present at the club that morning, and that was Marilyn King. Marilyn King was an absolutely gorgeous blonde drag queen who had styled herself on Marilyn Munro. She saw herself as the personification of Marilyn Munro, and after Marilyn Munro died, she believed that she was Marilyn Munro reincarnated. She was very religious, but she had this side to her that was drawn to men like Eddie Trigg, with whom she was in a relationship. And she'd gone to the carousel that morning, July 4, 1975, because Eddie had not been home all night and she wanted to know where he'd been and was he somebody who'd been with another woman that night because, you know, these were times when relationships were pretty fluid. She arrived just after Juanita had gone up the stairs. Juanita had arrived at 10.40 a.m. and Marilyn arrived, as she told me, at 11 o'clock where she'd gone up the stairs to be greeted by Shane Martin Simmons, who was standing outside the locked door into the VIP bar. And when she said, is Eddie in there? Shane told her, yes, Eddie's in there, but he's busy. You can't go in. So she'd gone back downstairs and waited. And Eddie and Shane Martin Simmons, what did they say happened that day? Were they interviewed? Were they interrogated about What took place? They were. And Eddie gave conflicting accounts of what had happened to police early in the investigation. But, of course, in the climate of the times, police put that to one side and focused on the other rumours that were being put about, about Juanita and the yellow car, about her having a history of disappearing. And, in fact, there was one story One claimed that she was seen at a pub at Windsor, west of Sydney. All of this fed the news coverage of the day and served to take the focus away from the real place that the police should have been looking at, and that is the carousel. So Eddie Trigg was interviewed, Shane Martin Simmons was interviewed, but it took two years before the police were able to charge Shane Martin Simmons and Eddie Trigg along with another man, Lloyd Marshall, with being involved in the conspiracy to abduct Juanita. Has anyone ever confessed or leaked information about Juanita's death and what happened? The best evidence that we have comes from Marilyn King. Now, after the 1983 inquest, as I say, the police did nothing. The investigation stalled and Arthur King and I picked it up. Now, in 2003, as I was preparing finally to publish my book, I went to New Zealand for a holiday. And while there, knowing that Marilyn King was a New Zealander, I thought I'd make inquiries to see if anybody might know about where she could be if she was, in fact, back in New Zealand because the police didn't know where she was. They'd made no effort to find her. And I spoke to a former colleague of mine, a former journalistic colleague, and she made inquiries for me and found out that, oh, yes, people have heard of Marilyn. She was involved in something big. Look, here's a phone number. So with that phone number, I spent a day on the phone. I was back in Australia by this stage, phoning several people, one after another. You need to ring this person, and I was told to ring another person. And finally, I spoke to Marilyn's mother, And I said, I want to speak to your daughter, Marilyn. And she said, oh, you mean Monet? I said, what? You mean Monet. Here's a phone number and you'll speak to Monet. So I rang and 
asked for Marilyn and I was told by the person on the end of the phone, I'm no longer Marilyn, I'm Mono. And Marilyn had gone back to living as a man and adopted the name Mono. And it was through that association with Marilyn stroke Mono that we really got to the nub of what happened as far as we will ever know about the conspiracy to abduct and to kill Juanita because Marilyn was there on that day. She was in a relationship with Eddie Trigg and it's crucial, the evidence that she gave us. Now, it's so crucial, you can only wonder just how much more could have been gained in this investigation if the police, after the inquest in 1983, had bothered to track down Marilyn, who by that stage had gone back to New Zealand. And the importance of Marilyn stroke Monet's evidence is this, because after coming back down the stairs from trying to see Eddie and being barred by Shane Martin Simmons, Marilyn sat waiting, chatting with Loretta Crawford before deciding that she was hungry and wanted to get something to eat. And she said to Loretta, I'll go and get some Kentucky Fried Chicken. But before doing that, she went back up to see if Eddie was still there. But there was something strange. Shane Martin Simmons was gone. The door was still locked into the bar, but nobody had come down the stairs. She went down into the street and the first thing she noticed was that when she had arrived a little while earlier, Eddie Trigg's big Dodge Phoenix sedan had been parked immediately outside the fire stairs that led down from the upstairs VIP lounge onto Rosalind Street. The car was gone. Eddie hadn't come down the stairs. Shane Martin Simmons hadn't come down the stairs. They could only have come down the fire stairs. Over on the corner of Rosalind Street and Darlinghurst Road, she saw something else that was strange. Shane Martin Simmons was standing on the corner. So she went over and asked Shane, where was Eddie? And Shane just shrugged his shoulders. So Marilyn went and got the takeaway food, took it back to the club and waited. And about 20 past one that afternoon, as she was talking to Loretta, she saw Eddie Triggs suddenly appear at the bottom of the stairs and motioning to her in an agitated state. So she excused herself from Loretta's company went down the stairs and Eddie, in this really excited state, said, we've got to go, and bundled her into the car and drove back to their flat in Ithaca Road, Elizabeth Bay. We have to get rid of the guns. We have to hide the guns, he told her. And it was on the way that Marilyn noticed something strange. Not only was Eddie agitated, but his fist was bruised and she wanted to know what had happened. He told her not to be nosy, don't worry about it. And when they got back to the flat while inside, she noticed that there was blood on Eddie's shirt, and she wanted to know what happened again. And again, Eddie said, don't worry about it. You don't need to know what's gone on, what's happened. And then after he'd taken off the shirt and given it to her to wash, she noticed that there was a piece of paper in the shirt pocket She pulled it out and it was a receipt for $130 signed by Juanita for the carousel to advertise in Juanita's paper. There was something very odd about that as well. It was spattered with blood. Eddie said, give it to me, and he tore off the bloodied section of the receipt. And it was at this point Marilyn Stroke Monet told me that she'd asked, what happened, Eddie? What did you do to her? Did you kill her? You didn't kill her, I hope, to which Eddie responded, she didn't feel a thing. This was the most gripping and believable account of what had happened. The way that it fell into place was much more believable, in my view, than Loretta Crawford's account, where she claimed she'd seen a gunman standing over Juanita's dead body. It tied up all the loose ends and the other thing about it was that Marilyn Stroke Monet was a religious person. 
I mean, I know that sounds odd when you consider the background, the milieu into which Marilyn found herself in 1975 among the thugs and killers and standover men of King's Cross, to which she was drawn, you know, like a moth to a flame. But in the flat that she shared with Eddie, she not only had a picture of Marilyn Munro on the wall, but she had a statue of Jesus on the dressing table. And when she'd gone back to New Zealand and decided to stop living as a woman and live as a man again, she embraced the church into which she'd been born many years earlier in New Zealand, embraced the church again and took up social work. And what was motivating her and why it was so fortunate from my point of view to finally track her down was that all of this information, all of these events had been playing on her conscience and she had one thing in mind and she was just waiting to really reveal her thoughts, her innermost thoughts about all of this. She wanted to save Eddie Trigg's soul. And that's what she said to me repeatedly over the years, that she wanted to save Eddie Trigg's soul, that he was going to go to his death, a killer, not having made peace with himself. And that was a very powerful motivation for her. And did he go to his death without ever confessing or speaking out? That's correct. After my book appeared, where I reported the initial views of Marilyn Stroke Monet for the first time, the police actually flew Monet over to Sydney on the 30th anniversary of Juanita's murder to set up a reunion with Eddie Trigg at the Abbott's Hotel in Alexandria. And the idea was that Marilyn Stroke Monet would be wired for any conversation that ensued with the intention that Eddie Trigg would admit something that could be used in evidence against him about the disappearance of Anita Nelson. But he didn't. And you can just imagine this. They're sitting at the bar chatting about old times, about 1975 and the carousel, and the subject of Juanita came up. Eddie Trigg told Monet, just stick to the old story, darling. He would not give any observations, any information at all. Now, I wrote to Eddie Trigg a few years after this. I said, Eddie, you've got away with the perfect murder. What about writing or recording? What happened? Give it to your solicitor and that after your death, this information can be made public so that Juanita's family can at last have some degree of closure. I never heard back from Eddie, but he kept the letter and the police found it when they went through his room at the Abbott Hotel after his death in 2013. So clearly he had a guilty conscience, but he just didn't know what to do with it. Finally, I want to ask you, is it possible to get justice for Juanita? Her body hasn't been found. The people who look likely to have been involved are no longer here. What does justice look like for Juanita and her family? You're right. It's beyond the chance now that a charge of murder can be laid against Eddie Trigg or Jim Anderson, and both of them should have been charged with murder because both of them are guilty of this murder. However, Jim died in 2003 and Eddie 2013, so that is no longer possible. The only hope is that somebody somewhere, perhaps somebody who was close to the scene at that time, maybe related to either of these men, might have heard something about where Juanita's body was buried. Now, it's quite likely, I believe, that the body is somewhere in the lower Blue Mountains because it was along the old F4 freeway coming back into Sydney that Juanita's black leather shoulder bag and its contents were found strewn along the side of the road. So to me, that seems to indicate that Juanita's body was buried and I believe it happened on the Monday after, given what Marilyn 
stroke Monet has revealed to me about Eddie leaving very early that Monday morning to drive somewhere and arriving back several hours later with his jeans torn and clothes caked in yellow mud, I believe the body is somewhere up there. And that's why we can only hope that the million-dollar reward that the police announced three months or so ago might just encourage somebody to have a memory to reveal where Juanita could be because the family is still desperate to have closure, to have resolution, at least know that they can take her remains to the family crypt at South Head Cemetery and bury her where there's been a cross planted alongside the crypt where her family has been buried over the decades. Peter Rees has been investigating and reporting on Juanita Nielsen's disappearance for decades. His book, Killing Juanita, is an unflinching examination of this cold case that finally puts to rest decades of speculation, providing the definitive answer that authorities never could or would. It was the winner of the 2004 Ned Kelly Award for True Crime and sparked a federal parliamentary inquiry and a secret reopening of the case by the New South Wales Police. This year, the book has been updated with new information. You can find a link to buy it in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jesse Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our producer is Gia Moylan. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, let us know. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or share the episode with friends so more people can hear our stories. And to hear more from me, you can find me on Mamma Mia Out Loud three times a week as well as our new podcast, Cancelled all about who's in, who's out and who cares in the world of celebrities.